So I'm going to deliver tonight on the sermon you were promised by Pastor Anderson on Thursday. You were told that there was going to be a Stephen sermon, and then there was the Philip sermon. You know, and I'm not faulting Pastor Mejia when he was here on Friday night. You know, he said, boy, I've got this other thing. I really want to preach it. And I said, preach it. You know, and then, you know, me being a preacher, whenever you know there's a subject that's kind of floating out there that, you know, an idea, you pounce on that and you run with it. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to preach tonight on the example of Philip, the example of Philip. Now, right out of the gate, it's, uh, let's just clarify who this is talking about, which Philip, because there's the Philip, the apostle. And then there's what was often referred to the Philip we're talking about tonight, Philip the Evangelist. And he's so, this is not the same guy. This is not Philip the Apostle. That's not, you know, and some people get confused about that. That's pretty common knowledge, but it is out there. Some people will, will get a little confused and think, is this talking about the, uh, the Apostle Philip? Well, it's real clear just from the context of the scripture that he's not. If you look there in verse 2, it says, Then the twelve called the multitude. Now, Philip, the apostle, is of that 12, the 12 disciples that Jesus called and appointed and ordained. So they're the, he's of that 12 uh, 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 that, that called the multitude of the disciples and said unto them, it is not reason that we should leave, tables, uh, leave the word of God and serve tables. And then commands them to look out uh, seven men uh, of honest report full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom who we may appoint over this business. So if, they were t if that was the same guy, you know, if, if Philip, uh, the Apostle Philip and Phil Philip the Evangelist were the same person, then selecting him as a deacon would have kind of defeated the purpose. You see what I'm saying? They're saying, hey, pick out 12, seven guys that are, that, so we can you know, give ourselves to the ministry of, word, of the word and prayer. And they got these guys together and said, oh, we need Philip to come down and, and be one of them. You know, that, would, that would absolutely defeat the purpose. So I think it's pretty easy to prove that the Philip here is talking about a different Philip, not Philip the apostle. I'm not going to belabor that point. But he is what is often uh, referred to as the seven deacons. Now, it doesn't necessarily say deacons in this passage, but you can see in Acts 6, they're, they're recognized as deacons not so much by a title, but rather by the fact that they served the church. And that's really what a deacon is. A deacon is somebody who is a servant, who is a minister of the church. They're an officer of the church. They're ordained in the church. But their purpose there is, you know, we see it here, you know, they're there to, to wait on the tables, the daily ministration, to take care of the, you know, the day-to-day -day tasks that have to be done. And Philip was one of these guys. Now, we heard a great sermon about Stephen, and, and, and he's one of the, you know, the primary guys that's, that's, that's mentioned here. He's the first one. But then it also mentions Philip, and, and we learn a lot about Philip in Acts chapter 8. You know, Acts chapter 7 is all about Stephen, you know, his sermon, his preaching, and the Jews running upon him and, and stoning him. Well, Acts 8 kind of picks up the story. And if you would, go over there. Acts chapter 8. <coughs> In Acts chapter 8, uh, that tells us more about, the apo uh, about, about Philip. You know, and this is also, you know, further evidence, if you need it, that this is talking about a different guy. Because in Acts chapter 8, it says in verse 1, uh, it says, And Saul was consenting in his death at that time, and there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the region, uh, regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And, of course, we know the story in Acts 8. This Philip, he's not, in, he's not there. He's one of the people that is scattered abroad. You know, further evidence that it's not an apostle. But I promise you I wouldn't believe the point, and here I am doing it. But really what we see here in Acts chapter 8 is that, you know, Philip, one of the great things we can learn from him, you know, that we can all apply to our hearts is, or to our lives is the fact that he has the heart of a servant. You know, that's a really important uh, attribute that we want to have as God's people. And I believe that, you know, God, you know, puts people in positions like this who, who, who have that kind of heart, not, not to lift them up or exalt them, but to serve as an example. And that's what we're looking at, Philip. That's why we're looking to him tonight. We're looking to Philip tonight as an example. Not to just read about Philip and say, oh, that's nice, you know, great story. But to actually take that story of Philip and apply it to our own lives. And one of the great things about Philip, when you read about him, is that he has a servant's heart. You know, and that's a, that's a really important attribute, especially if you're going to make it in the Christian life. If you're going to be a, a blessing, you have to have a heart that desires to serve. You no, know, if you're somebody who desires to go into the ministry, you know, you need to have a servant's heart like Philip. You need to be somebody, and it also shows us that if you're filled with the Holy Ghost, like these seven men were, that were of honest report and filled with the Holy Ghost, part of that is going to be you, uh, you know, that, that filling of the Spirit, you know, that's going to give you the heart of a servant. You're going to desire to serve other people and to help other people. And 
We could see that Philip had, you know, a heart of a servant because of the fact that he was not a respecter of persons. He was not a respecter of persons. Acts chapter 8, you know, great chapter. We're all familiar with it, but look at verse 5. It says, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria, and that's a significant place, Samaria. And he went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying, out, crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with, uh, possessed with them, and many were taken with palsies, and that were lame were healed, and there was great joy in that city. So we can see also that, you know, Philip being ordained as a deacon, you know, part of his job was not just to minister, but also he had to be a guy who could preach, go out and preach the gospel, you know, and, and tell others about the Lord. And he was able to do that, you know, and the reason why he was, you know, did such a great job is because he had the heart of a servant. And it's interesting that, he's, that when Philip, this, this persecution takes place and the apostles kind of hang back in Jerusalem, he chooses to go to Samaria. Now, the Lord was probably leading in that, I'm sure. But if you recall, you know, that was not a place that was real popular with the apostles or, or Jews of that day. You know, because they were, they were, you know, they considered them mixed breeds and stuff like that. And, it was, and it's kind of a racial connotation. They're, you know, they were a bit racist, you know, quite frankly. But if you go over to Luke chapter 9, go over to Luke chapter 9, keep something in Acts 8, you'll I'll remind us of this story in Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. And it came to pass, when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into the village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. So he's passing by. Jesus said, I'm going to Jerusalem. Why don't you go over to Samaria and let them know I'm going to be coming by. So the messengers go by, and they go to make ready for him. And they did not receive him, because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. So the Samaritans are like, well, he's going to Jerusalem anyway. They're not excited about Jesus coming. They kind of reject him here. And when his disciples, uh, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? I mean, these guys are just so jealous for the Lord. They're just so fervent for the Lord. They're saying, well, if you're going to reject him, you know, I'm just, why don't we just call it on fire and just destroy the city? You know, and there's a lot going on there. You know, is it really, is James and John, are they really wanting to do that just because they're so zealous for the Lord? Or is maybe they just kind of see an opportunity to get back at the Samaritans for, you know, just something they don't like about them? You know, because there, there was a real rift there. They didn't really care for those people. <laughs> so, you know, this could be one of, either one of those things. But notice what the Lord said. He says, if he turn and rebuke them, and he said, you know not what manner of spirit you are of, for the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. So he rebukes this spirit. You know, and we should not have this attitude of, you know, if somebody says the wrong thing or doesn't write on this or that, that we're just instantly like, we're just going to call down the fire. You know, we're just going to run them off. We're just going to write them off. You know, you have to give people a chance to grow. You have to give people a chance to be taught things, to be corrected, and to grow and to get things right. Okay? And that's the spirit that we're supposed to have. And that's the spirit that Philip had. I mean, when he had an opportunity to go anywhere, he's like, well, I guess I'll go to Samaria. I guess I'll go there. And really, he's showing more compassion here on the Samaritans than the apostles did earlier. And the apostles are just like, well, torch the place. You know, and now they appoint these seven guys. And the seven guys that they appointed, one of them, Philip, is like, well, I'm going to go preach to them now. Of course, the church has been scattered, so on and so forth. But he's showing a little bit more compassion than even the apostles did previously. Now, I'm sure the apostles got their heart right. In fact, we'll read here. We know that that's the case. But it may even be that Philip, you know, through his, his, the heart that he had to serve, even inspired the apostles themselves. Which goes to show you that, you know, it's not all about rank in the local church. You know, just because you retain an office or you're ordained this or ordained that, that doesn't just make you the, the supreme, you know, this doesn't make me, what is the term, the, the archdeacon? Was that what the term, you know? Yeah. I'm the arch, you know? <laughs> these titles, they're there for a reason, you know, because there's an authority structure in the local church. But, you know, that doesn't mean that just because I'm the deacon here that, you know, I can't be inspired or motivated or moved by other people in the church, you know, who aren't, who don't have those titles, okay? And if you look here in Acts chapter 8, look at verse 14. Go back there to Acts chapter 8. We'll look at verse 14. So Philip... You know, he goes down to um, Samaria and the Samaritans, you know, they come out and they, and they, and it says there was great joy in that city. Amen. So they just, they're just loving the fact that he came. 
They're getting saved. He's doing these miracles. People are being healed. It's a great time. Now look at verse 14. It says, Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem, you know, they're still trying to hang back and just sit tight in Jerusalem. They don't want to, they don't want to do what Jesus said to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature. They're just kind of hanging back. It says, But when they heard that, that, that Jerusalem had received the word of God, and who was it that brought the word of God? It was Philip with that servant's heart that he had. They sent unto them Peter and John. They said, well, you know, we can't, we can't let this guy that we had ordained to wait on tables to get all the glory. We better send some other guys down there, right? Now, that's probably not what's going on, but they were sending him down there to, you know, help him. You know, I think maybe Philip inspired the other apostles at this point. They said, wow, Philip went down there. He's tearing it up. Let's, let's get behind him. Let's back him up on this. Let's help him uh, go down there and do a great work. It says they sent Peter and John, and look at verse 25, and they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, now, it's interesting there that it's John, right? John, the same guy who's saying, well, shall we just, you know, let's light him up. Back when Jesus was here, saying, torch the place. Let's call on fire. And now he's come all the way around, and he's there, and he's ministering these people. He's preaching the word of, of the Lord unto them. And it says that they went and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. You know, I think Philip having a servant's heart and going to the Samaritans, I think he even inspired men like Peter and John to go and do a great work as well. So it just goes to show us that, you know, it's more about the heart in the servant more than anything. The type of, you know, you can inspire other people, whether you're the pastor, whether you're the deacon, whether you're just a, you know, a boy or girl in the church, you know, it just you having a heart for other people can move others to be like you. <coughs> and, I, you know, Philip has the heart of a servant. We see that, first of all, because he's not a respecter of persons. He's not going to say, well, pff, the Samaritans. There's no way I'm going there. You know, and, and not only that, he's not, he, he's not uh, you know, partial that way, but he also cares you know, just about the one person. You know, he's not just impressed. He's not just only worried about reaching a whole all the villages of the Samaritans. I mean, obviously that was something that he cared about. Otherwise, he wouldn't have gone there and preached to him. But he also cares about the one person. You know, he's willing to even go after just one of the lost sheep. Right? Look at verse 26. And it says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, unto the way that, way, that goeth before, uh, from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, had come from Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his, ch in his chariot, reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip replied, It's just one guy. I mean... <laughs> I got all these villages of Samaritans I could be reaching. I could, I could send me on a crusade. You know, give me, give me a, a large crowd to preach to, Lord. I mean, what are you going to waste my time on one guy for? Just one person. Didn't you see what I did back there? I mean, I'm moving the apostles to, to do great works. Don't waste my talent on one person. Is that, the, is that the attitude that Philip had? No, he had a servant's heart. You know, he was full of the Holy Ghost, and he cared about even one person. And it says in verse 30, and Philip dragged his feet. Well, I guess if I have to, I'll go talk to this Ethiopian. If you say so, Lord. No, it says he ran. You know, that's significant. You know, now, that's not a requirement for being a deacon. Okay, let me just clarify that, all right? Because <laughs> if it is, I'm disqualified. <laughs> Does it say how far he ran, though, right? <laughs> But it says that Philip ran. You know, he was excited to go get talk to this guy. Right. He said, oh, you want me to go talk to him, Lord? You got it. He didn't, you know, make his case and make a bunch of excuses. He said, I'm going to go witness to even one guy. He didn't care if he was preaching to whole villages. He didn't care if he was getting thousands saved, even if he was getting one person saved. He just wanted to serve other people. Amen. And it said that Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, understand what thou readest. And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And the place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb, he was dumb, uh, he was dumb before a shear, and so on and so forth. Verse 38, and he says, uh, we'll jump down to verse 36. And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water, and the Enoch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So this is a great example, you know, speaking of baptisms. 
you know, you know, you get saved and then you get baptized. Yeah. It's not, and you know, it's, it, one isn't dependent upon the other either. Well, you know, baptism is, you have to be saved to get baptized, but you don't have to be baptized. You don't have to get s baptized to get saved. Yeah. Right. We all understand that. That's, a, that's another sermon. <coughs> but we see that, you know, Philip was ordained as a servant. You know, back in Acts chapter 6, when, when he said, go pick out guys, pick out these seven guys that, you know, are full of wisdom, the Holy Ghost. You know, part of that, I believe that they chose Philip. And I'm sure there was other guys there that they were just, well, these are the only seven guys that are full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. I'm sure there were other people around that had the Holy Spirit, that had the wisdom, that could have done just as good a job. But maybe what set Philip apart from some of the others was the fact that he was willing to serve wherever and whenever he was needed. He wasn't going to say, you know, oh, I'm only going to serve in this city or I'm only going to serve when the circumstances are just right or only if I'm going to get certain accolades or only if I'm going to be recognized. You know, only if, if my, you know, I'm too good to serve here, but this will do for me. He was willing to serve anywhere, at any time, any place. He was ready to go and serve wherever he was needed. Look at verse 40 there. It says, but Philip was found at Azotus and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. You know, he went above and beyond, too. You know, he had the heart of a servant. He wasn't somebody who's just like, well, I did my duty. I'm done now. It doesn't say here that the Lord, you know, to told him to go preach here. He just, start, he just kept right on going. He might say, well, this is what the Lord wants. I'm just going to keep right on going. And he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. So we see, first of all, that, you know, one of the things we can learn from the example of Philip is that he has the heart of a, of a servant. He's willing to serve anybody, any number of people, anywhere. But not only that, you know, Philip was a reliable and faithful man. He was a reliable and faithful man. And, you know, churches need reliable, faithful men, not just behind the pulpit. They need them, you know, in the pew as well. That's what makes up the backbone of a church is reliable, faithful individuals, men and women, people you can just count on that are going to be there, that are going to help out and, 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 and play their part. So if you look in Acts chapter, uh, Acts chapter 6, it says there in verse 3, Wherefore, brethren, look out among you seven men of honest report. Now what that means there is that they have a good reputation. You know, the report of them is that they're honest people. You know, that they, they, ha they have a good reputation. You know, I believe that's, you know, one of the best things you can ever compliment, you can ever pay another man is to say he's a good man. That's one of the best things you could ever say about somebody. You know, have that said about you is, is a great thing. To say, hey, that guy is a, is a good man. Or that woman is a faithful lady. You know, that's something to, that we should all strive for. And I believe that's what Paul, or excuse me, Philip had. You know, he was one of the seven men that had, what, an honest report. They said, hey, this is a good guy. He's faithful. He's reliable. He's going to do a good job. And if you would, uh, go over to Acts chapter 21. You know, he had a good reputation you know, and he maintained that reputation. I mean, he wasn't just one of these guys that just, you know, got all fired up for the Lord, did some works, and then just kind of petered out. He wasn't one of these guys that just got all fired up for the Lord, you know, won a bunch of souls to Christ, and then just kind of faded away. You know, he kept serving God day in, day out for his entire life. He was a faithful, reliable man. You know, that's the type of people we should strive to be. We should strive to be like Philip. We should be willing to serve anybody, anywhere, and not only that, but we should be willing to do that for the rest of our lives. We should keep that servant's heart and never lose that. Because if you, you know, years later, he hasn't lost his reputation. Now remember in Acts, Acts chapter 8, it says that he came, he preached in all the cities to what? Till he came to where? To Caesarea, right? And that's where he kind of parked. I think, I don't know everything that went on in Philip's life, but we're about to read about him here, you know, many years later in Acts chapter 21. You know, it seems, sounds to me like he got there, you know, and he kind of settled in. You know, he, wa he also, you know, it's just another great attribute. He was willing to go anywhere, but also when it was time for him to park and stay in one spot, he was willing to do that. Hey, if this is where I need to be, that's where I'm going to be. If that's where I'm called, that's where I'm going. I'm going to preach wherever I need to be. We look here in Acts chapter 21, verse 1. It says, And it came to pass if we had gone after, uh, that, that after we were gone, gotten from them and had launched, we came with a straight course over and unto Kuz, and the day following unto Rhodes, and from thence unto Patara. This is, of course, talking about the Apostle Paul. Okay, the Apostle Paul and Luke and others are traveling. This is many years later after Acts 8. I mean, Acts 8, Paul hasn't even gotten saved yet. You know, he's still Saul. 
He still hasn't gone into the desert for three years in, 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 in Arabia. He still hasn't done a lot of things. A lot of pa time has passed between Acts chapter 8 and Acts chapter 21. And it says there, and after finding a ship and sailing over into Phoenicia, we went abroad and set forth. Now when we discovered Cyprus, we left it on the left hand and sailed into Syria and landed at Tyre, for the ship was there to unlaid her burden. And finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. And when we had accomplished those days, we departed and went our way. And they all brought us on our way with wives and children till we were out of the city, and we kneeled down on the shore and prayed. Verse 6, And when we had taken our leave one of another, we took ship and returned home again. And when we had finished our course from Tyre, we came to uh, Ptolemaeus and saluted the brethren and abode with them one day. And the next day we were that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, where we last left Philip, right? And entered in the house of Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and, and abode with him. So all these years later, Philip is still there in Caesarea, and he still has that reputation. They're like, hey, where do you stay when you're in Caesarea? Oh, you go to Philip's house. You know, he's a faithful man. He's going to receive the brethren. You know, you can go there. You're going to be safe. He's going to nourish you. He's going to help you. You can get refreshed. You can go on and continue to serve God. <clears throat> you know, Philip settled in Caesarea, and he was faithful, and he served the Lord there. You know, just a great guy. I mean, it just goes to show you the, the, the servant's heart that he had. You know, he could have gone anywhere. He could have done anything. But he said, you know what? This is where I need to be. I need to settle in Caesarea. I need to park it there and, and put down my root and dig in and, and just really reach this town. Okay? And, you know, he, keeps, he has that reputation of being a faithful man all these years later, that even the, now the Apostle Paul is coming to him. You know, and that what should show us is that if you want to be a reliable, faithful person, at some point you've got to put your root down. At some point you just got to settle down and say, this is where I'm at, and, and just dig in and just go at it. You know, and I understand life takes us different places at different times and there's seasons. But, you know, at some point you just have to say, you know, this is where I'm at. This is where I'm going to stay. And I'm just going to serve God for the rest of my days and just be a blessing there. And unless God, you know, makes it very clear that he needs to pick you up and move you somewhere else, just be content to stay where you are. Keep serving God. And I believe that's what Philip had. He had a servant's heart. He said, you know, I'm just going to stay here and I'm going to serve God. And he maintained that, that reputation for being a reliable faithful individual. And not only that, you know, Philip, he, he gives us a great uh, uh, example of being, having a servant's heart, but also being somebody reliable because he was willing to go anywhere and preach to anyone and that he was willing to settle down and do what he needed to do. But not only that, but he also raised faithful children. You know, that's a, usually a really big, uh, you know, indicator of what kind of person you're dealing with. You know, if you see a man or, or a woman we're raising good, godly children. You can, that doesn't happen by accident. Right. <laughs> kids, you know, newsflash, that does, the kids don't turn out like that without a lot of hard work, without somebody actually putting some effort into that right. and being careful and teaching and instructing and disciplining. That's something that takes a lot of work. That takes a person who being reliable, that takes a person being faithful, and, and, and that's the type of person Philip was. Look there at verse 9. It says they entered into his house, and in verse 9, the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. You know, he had pure children. They weren't, his daughters weren't out running around, gallivanting, you know, and, and just running around town, living loose. You know, they were in dad's house under his supervision, and they were prophesying. You know, they were teaching, they were instructing, and, 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 and you know, they were faith. Why is that? Because Philip was a faithful man. Because Philip was a reliable person. All these years later, you know, he still has these faithful children. <clears throat> and if you would, go over to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. <clears throat> so all these years later, you know, Philip, it's interesting the life of Philip because, you know, you can't really say Philip's still a deacon, can you? At this point in the story. I mean, pretty, he gets in, he's, he's ordained a deacon, but then the church that he's a, a deacon of gets persecuted and everybody leaves. And the apostles are hanging back and he all of a sudden we see him. That's why he's called Philip the Evangelist, right? That's the office he's really fulfilling. But he was a deacon at one point. But even all these years later, he's still fulfilling the requirements of a deacon. <clears throat> so if you look there in 1 Timothy chapter 3, look at verse 8. It says, Likewise uh, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. 
You know, and that's not always, we, we read over those, go, oh, yeah, no problem. I could do that. You know, it's not, it's not always <laughs> as easy as it sounds. You know, I'm only two years into being a deacon, and I hope I can be like Philip and just remain faithful for many, many, many years to come. I hope I could, you know, maybe someday somebody will blow through Tucson and say, hey, let's go see Brother Corbin. Amen. You know, and I've got my faithful children still with me, still meeting those requirements. And what's great about Philip is I don't even think you would really consider him a, a deacon at this point. You know, but it, yet he's still fulfilling those qualifications, yet he's still a faithful, reliable man. Which just goes to show you that, you know, the, the position doesn't make the man. The man makes the position. And it's not, you know, that's the way it works. And it says there in verse 9, Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience, and let these first be fruit proved, and then let them use the office of, a, office of a deacon being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slander, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husband of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. So he's, you know, obviously he's still meeting these, these qualifications. You know, and that's a tough qualification. You know, for me, it's pretty easy, but, you know, because I got such a great wife. <laughs> and I do. You know, but that, that, you know, ruling your house well, that takes effort. That takes work. That takes, you know, it takes being a faithful man. It's not something that, you know, there's people that aren't able to do that. Houses fall apart. Marriages get out of whack. You know, and if that's the case, you know, disqualified. I mean, these are, these are very clear qualifications in Scripture. <laughs> and why is it? Why is it that the, the Bible even has these qualifications for a deacon? It's because deacons, you know, it's not, it's not to lift them up, to make them, you know, into some, you know, make them, you know, exalt them in some way. You know, yes, they're lifted up, but is it, is it to, so that they can receive glory and praise? No, it's because those people that are lifted up in that position are there to, to serve as an example. You know, that's why you have to meet these qualifications to have that office, to have that title of deacon or bishop or elder. You know, you have to meet these qualifications because when you, when you have that title and you have that position, other people are looking at you and they're watching you and they're following your example, or at least they should. And they should be shown a good example. That's why it says, if you're there, go over to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13. It said, For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchase themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. He said, look, if you use that office well, you get a good degree. Now, he's not talking about a diploma. You know, it's never going to be, duh. What's the, how's that song go? Duh, 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 duh. I'm probably doing the wedding march. I don't know. The, I'm not real familiar with the high school graduation song. You know, but it's never going to be like, oh, you, brother, Deacon Russell, you've done, you, you did four years at, at Tucson. Now we're going to take that little tassel and move over to the side. You know, that's not what he's talking about. Because the degree just really means rank, you know, or an official rank. They have a degree. Right? You know, you reach a certain degree or whatever. So I think that's what he's talking about here. They, they have reached a good rank. You know, they have a good position. They have a good title. You know, they're, 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 uh, they're um, uh, really what it's for is for the purpose of distinguishing leadership. You know, somebody has to lead in a local church. You know, somebody has to take the reins and lead a church and say, this is the direction we're going. You know, and that's the pastor ultimately. You know, and ultimately this church is under Pastor Stephen Anderson up in, in, in uh, Tempe, Arizona. You know, we're a satellite church. But, you know, he's kind of, I'm presiding over, you know, I'm helping lead. I'm leading as I would think that he would want it led, okay? Point being, somebody is still leading, right? And, and deacons, you know, they get a good degree. They get a rank because why? Because they're leaders too, you know? And here's the thing, you know, not everyone probably knows about it, but you know, our previous deacon, you, it goes to show you, you can, you can not use the office of a deacon well. Yeah. You know, and if, <laughs> you know, I've, I've had to try and, you know, live that down for him. Like, you know, I've had to make, I had to come into this and, you know, like Trump, make the deacon great again. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I had to, I had to re hit the reboot. But it's kind of, everybody's like, oh, another deacon, huh? Here we go. <laughs> and it's just like, it's like they set a watch. How long is he going to make it, you know? Yeah. Hopefully I've proven I'm not going to, you know, start <laughs> preaching some strange heresy. You know, I don't even, I don't, not even that creative to come up with one, but, <laughs> you know, he's saying, look, you know, if you use it well, you get a good degree. It goes to show you somebody, some, some people can use it poorly, okay? Yeah, <clears throat> and here's the thing. There are qualifications for a reason for the deacon because of the fact that you are serving as an example, like Philip. You know, we should be able to look to men in the Bible, or, you know, or even in our own lives, the people that are, you know, fulfilling these roles, or in the scripture, you know, and, and say a good example of somebody who's faithful, 
somebody who loves the Lord, somebody who's willing to serve any time, any place, somebody who loves people, you know, somebody who wants to see souls saved, somebody who wants to do a work for God. You know, and if we follow the example of Philip, you know, we might not be appointed deacons, now self-excluded, obviously, but, you know, if you say, hey, I'm going to follow the example of Philip tonight, you know, I'm going to be like Philip, that doesn't guarantee that one day you're going to be a deacon, right? I mean, one, if you're a woman, you're automatically, <laughs> you know, that, that is not for you. That's very biblical. But here's the thing, you know, why follow the example of Philip? Is it to get a title? Is it so you could just say, well, you know, I'm a deacon now, or I've reached some status? No, the reason why you want to follow uh, uh, the example of, of, of deacon, of the deacon or men like Philip, is so that, you know, you can live a life that's pleasing to the Lord as well. So that you can be considered a faithful man. So that you can be considered a faithful lady in the church. You know, we might never be able to fulfill that role of deacon, but you know, we could all be evangelists, can't we? Amen. We could all do that. And when I read the life of Philip, you know, he starts out as a deacon. You know, and he, that's something, I don't know how long he did that, but it doesn't seem like it was very long. And that church gets scattered. And then he's just like, well, if I can't be deacon, I'm not going to do anything then. Was that his attitude? Well, if I can't rank in the church, if I couldn't have a good degree in the local church and be called this by this title or that title, I'm just not going to do it. That wasn't his attitude at all. He said, oh, well, that's over? Well, let me just go into being an evangelist, which is a role that we can all fulfill, every single one of us, man, woman, boy, girl, we can all be evangelists. You know, we can do some amazing things as evangelists. I mean, you look at the life of Philip. When were his most amazing works done? Was it as deacon? I don't know that there was probably a lot of exciting things going on maybe when he was deacon. Let's watch Philip, you know, clear, clear a table. Let's watch Philip set up the buffet table, right? Let's watch Philip go up to, you know, the taco shop and get a bunch of meat and bring it back and feed everybody. Wow, that's amazing. That's the most exciting thing in the world. Let's watch Philip vacuum or wipe down a table or pay a bill. You know, or, or keep the lights on, whatever. You know, what, some mundane, you know, the, the daily ministration. That's not exactly the most glorious position. You know, I'm thankful for this position. I love being the deacon, but, you know, some, not every, it's not just, you know, one exciting moment after another as the deacon. You know, it's like it's a lot of it's, you know, pretty mundane. Cut this check, you know, deposit that. Go clean this up. Order this. There's a lot of just... You guys want to follow, I mean, you want me to start writing this down? Should we, should we should write the life and times of Deacon Russell? Is that going to be a national bestseller? Let me tell you about the time I scrubbed this toilet. You know, it was, and this thing was dirty. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know, let me just tell you about all the exciting thing I do as Deacon. You know, we look at Philip, you know, he did a lot, a lot of the most exciting things that he did was after the church was scattered, when he was known as Philip the Evangelist. That's, you know, and that's the thing. You want to live an exciting Christian life? Be Philip the Evangelist. Don't get so, you know, you know, worked up about attaining some rank or some position or some title in the church because it's really not all that glamorous. You know, rather, you know, just strive to be more like Philip the Evangelist because you get to see some amazing things. I mean, he's going down preaching to the Samaritans. People are getting saved. He's, these miracles are taking place. You know, and we might not be out, you know, casting demons out today, but you know, the greatest, you know, in the list of miracles, Jesus, you know, he says, go back and tell John that the dead are raised, you know, the, 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 the blind receive their sight, the, the deaf hear, the lame walk. But what's the last thing he said in that list of miracles? The poor have the gospel preached to them. He lists all these miracles and the last things. Go tell John the Baptist that the poor have the gospel preached to them. And we want to, we want to see, do all these miracles and things like that. And I don't believe that's for us today. But I'll tell you, there is one miracle we can go do, and that's go preach the gospel. Because every time you preach the gospel to somebody and they get saved, that's a miracle. Amen. So I want to I work miracles. Go preach the gospel then. Amen. And watch, and it, and it never ceases to amaze me, and I've been at it for a little while, when you knock on a door and say, hey, can I show you from the Bible? And they say, yeah. And every time I'm like, oh, really? Oh, wow. Well, let me show you then. And then you explain it to them. And I'm just reading the Bible and explaining it pretty simply. And then the light starts to turn on there. You can tell the Holy Spirit's working in that person's heart. And you ask them, do you believe this? Do you believe this? Do you believe this? You want to pray and receive Christ and say, I do. That amazes me every single time. Amen. You never think I, that happens. I walk away and go, this is so boring. I want to go be the deacon. 
I want to go do. De- I would just want to go deacon things. I want to go do deaconly things. This is evangelist stuff, you know. This is for the birds. No, that's what I want. I want more of that. A lot of times when I'm, you know, deaconing or whatever that is, you know, <laughs> I'm like, man, I want to go do some evangelizing. That's what I want to go do. You know, I want to go up to the Yakima tribe and, and preach to the, you know, all the natives up there and see them get saved. I want to go back. You know, I can't wait for the Navajo reservation to open back up and go preach to them. That's what we should desire. That's, that's where the amazing things happen. I mean, look at Acts chapter 21, verse 8. Acts chapter 21, verse 8. And the next day, they that were of Paul's company departed and came to Caesarea. And we entered into Philip's house. The evangelist was one of the seven and abode with him. And that same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and bowed in his own hands and it said unto him, Thus saith the Holy Ghost. And so on and so forth. I mean, imagine being Philip. I mean, you're just kind of going, you're just going about your day, raising your kids, you know, being, you know, evangelizing, just living your life, being a good man, being a godly man. It's the Apostle Paul. I mean, that would be a pretty cool visit. Even back then, you know, I, I think Paul's, the, his reputation got, they, everyone kind of knew in that circle who the Apostle Paul was. And not that, you know, he's some big shot or Paul, Apostle Paul was trying to be somebody. But he was a man of reputation. Whether he was trying to or not, he was somebody. I mean, it's pretty cool, you know, when you're just being faithful like Philip. Sometimes you get to meet some pretty cool people. Yeah. You know, we get to do that. You know, I, I mean, Pastor Bruce, when he was here, and I'm not saying that he thinks he's all that in a bag of chips, but I thought it was pretty cool to get to meet Pastor Mejia. Oh, yeah. Spend time with him. You know, talk with him. Just, you know, get to know him. I'm sure if you talk to Paul, you'd probably find out he's a lot like just ordinary guys, you know, just a humble guy trying to serve God, that God used in a great way. Right. Point being, it's when you're fulfilling the role of an evangelist, like Philip, when you're being like Philip in this way, you know, you get to see some cool things. You get to meet some interesting people. You know, we get to have fellowship with one another. Amen. You know, and then you get to see Agabus show up and, and pronounce this prophecy on Paul. I mean, <laughs> just to be fly in the room, that would have been cool, right? Like, man, I was there when Paul was told, don't go, and he went anyway. I mean, he had some stories to tell, right? <laughs> you know, he got to receive some godly company for many days. I mean, we, we've probably all had to re- receive some company from time to time, but they're not all company. You know? Sometimes it's like, you know, somebody we'd rather not have around. <laughs> it's like, oh, they're coming. Oh, we've got to put up with it. You know, because company, what's the saying? Company is like fish. After a few days, it starts to stink. <laughs> I don't think that was the case with the Apostle Paul. I think when he left, you know, he was kind of like, oh, man, kinda, I'm, I'm kind of sorry that had to end. It would be cool to have him stick around. You know, you, if you live the life of the evangelist, if you be like Philip in this way, man, you get to get to know some people. You get to know some pretty cool people. You get to make some good friendships. You know, that's one thing we've got. We could celebrate two years here in this church. And we made some friendships in this church. We got people that we've gotten to know and will continue to get to know. And that, uh, you know, that, that's, that's special. You know, we shouldn't count that for nothing. Amen. You know, he also got to reach the villages, right, of the Samaritans. He got to go out and do all this great work. Well, you know what? We could do that here. We could reach Tucson. We could go reach all the small cities around here. We could go reach and knock the doors in Morency County and, and Safford. We could, you know, we could reach the villages of Arizona. You know, from this church, we could do that. We could be like him. If we're willing to follow the example of Philip and be like him and not get so hung up on a title and be more about the work that needs to be done, have that servant's heart. You know, we could raise godly families like Philip did. You know, that's one of the great things about, you know, following his example is that you also will raise godly children who will love the Lord and and serve him. How about this? If you follow the example of Philip, not only do you get to, you know, have, make great friendships, have great company, do great works, and, you know, winning souls to Christ, raising godly families. How about this? You get to retain a good reputation. You get to get to the end of your life and say, I've finished the course. I've, you know, I've kept the faith. You get to get to the end of your life and people say, that's a, that, yeah, that's a good man. That's a good woman. That's a faithful person. You can, have, you can retain a good reputation if you're willing to be like Philip. You know, and what, what is it that Philip had? He had the heart of a servant. And that's really that, the best thing that he had going for him. He was just a humble guy. Hey, you need someone to serve as the deacon? I'll do that. Oh, this isn't going to work out? Okay, well, let's just go be an evangelist then. 
Why? Because he had the heart of a servant because he loved people. And all he wanted to do was help people. All he wanted to do was preach to people. And look, if you'll follow that example, you can have all these things that Philip had. You know, you can have great friendships. You can have a godly family. And you can end your life, you know, with a good reputation. But that's the thing. You've got to follow his example. Those things aren't just going to fall out onto you on accident. And that's not how it happened for Philip. You know, he had to get full of the Holy Ghost. He had to get some wisdom. That's what we need to do. We need to make sure we're walking in the Spirit, that we're reading the Word of God, that we're being filled with the Word of God, that we have the wisdom and, and, and to, 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 to gain all these things, to be like Philip, to walk in the Spirit. And then we can have these things. They're not just gonna, we're not just going to trip over one day and be like, oh, all of a sudden I'm, I'm a faithful man. Right. No, you have the purpose to do that. Yeah. Okay. So that's my message tonight. I want to encourage you to follow the example of Philip because there's a lot of great things that Philip got to experience. But it required him, again, having that servant's heart. Let's go ahead and pray.